air five somebody, tell them it's good to be at the hill. Yeah. Was anybody else ready for 2021? Six of us. Six of us. Uh, man, what a year, huh? I was thinking, man, in 2020, well, we've been, May, Pastor Megan and I have got to hit all the, uh, all the churches, and we got to go to the Arkansas church last month, and got to go to uh, our, our home church, so to speak, um, the church that we grew up in ministry-wise in Joplin, and then you guys got Pastor Steve last week. Was that fire or what? <laughs> Wasn't that so good? Uh, and so um, that was, I went to his church the week before. So we just had a great week, but I was thinking, a great month, but I was thinking um, in 2020, man, a lot changed, right? Like we got experience to uh, uh, shutdowns and qu anybody have to quarantine in 2020? Anybody have to quarantine more than once in 2020? <laughs> Amen. Wow. Kids got, got to homeschool at the end of the year and partway through this year. And what a year, man. And to top it all off, they took the office off Netflix. I mean, it's, it's a rough year, man. It's a rough year. It's a rough year, man. Uh, but I, th I was thinking, and Jason and I talked about this in a little video we did while we were deer hunting the other day. But I was thinking how, like, in our minds, like, we're going, I can't wait for 2021 because it's all going to be better. Right? But the reality is, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Right? Like if you don't change something, you're going to have the same 21 as you did 20. And so if you're hoping for change, be the change. Come on, somebody. Um, and I was thinking about that in the context of, of where we're going this year. And I was thinking 2021, we need to preach some fire and vision and we need to get people excited. Um, but the Lord said, no, don't do that. So we're not doing that. Amen. Uh, we're starting a new series and I'm really excited. Um, for the next really like three months, we're going to be talking about the playbook. Right? The, what God's plan is for your life and how to defeat the wiles and the schemes of the enemy. So this January, um, in this playbook series, we're talking about the enemy's plan. And they'll throw that graphic up there. We're going to be talking about the enemy's plan uh, in this series. And how, as a matter of fact, in 2 Kings chapter 6, we see this setting of scripture where Elisha, the prophet, um, the Arameans, would, they would like scheme and plan on how to defeat the children of Israel. And the, the prophet, Elisha, would go tell the king, he'd say, hey, look, they're going to come around this mountain and, and around this corner and they're going to set up over here and they're going to defeat you. And so here's what you need to do to win. And sure enough, the king of Israel would go do that and they would defeat the Arameans. Um, because the reality is New Testament says, Paul says, I don't want you or God doesn't want you to be surprised or unaware of the schemes and the plans the enemy has. Come on somebody, amen. Like, in athletics, it's so important. Matter of fact, my football coaches growing up, like we would go through film and they would have it broken down. Here's my football. My defensive coordinator would say, on first and 10, they'll, they run the ball 87% of the time. On second and short, they throw the ball 76% of the time. And of that 76% of the time, 83% of that is thrown to the left. Bow that's your side. So on second and short, you need to be prepared. Now, does it mean they threw it every time? No, but it helped me to know what the enemy... You're not with me yet. What the enemy was trying to do to defeat me. That's what God says. God says, listen, I don't want you to be unaware of the schemes of the enemy and how he plans to defeat you in your life, right? And so I, we're, we're breaking down the setting of Scripture in 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're talking the enemy's plan, what he did to Elijah, and, and the plan he had to defeat Elijah and all of Israel. And we see this in four easy steps that he started to do. We're just going to talk about one today. But the first thing he did to Elijah was discourage him. And then he isolated him. And then he caused him to become lethargic or indifferent. And then he caused him to lose focus. Does that sound like 2020 at all to anybody? You just got discouraged, and, just, and then you begin to isolate yourself, and then you become lethargic. I don't care. Anybody? Okay. That's okay. First crowd liked it. You guys are perfect in every way. I forget. Come on, somebody. But in reality, in 21, we've decided, y'all, as individuals, we got to go forward. Come on now. We've decided that we got to advance in the, the callings and the things and the anointings that God has for our life as a church and our lives for, as individuals. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. On the 17th of January, uh, we have our semi-annual uh, we, it's legally called a business meeting because of bylaws, but it's a revival service. Come on, somebody. We're going to have a blast Sunday night, 6 p.m. Come be a part of that. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 through 3, and let's get into his word. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. 
Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And then Elijah was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life. My God, come on now. And came to Beersheba, which has belonged to Judah. And he left his servant there. So Elijah, y'all, um, shows up on the scene a few chapters earlier. And he says, hey, Ahab, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. And then he disappears for three and a half years. He shows back up on the scene. He says, I want to talk to you, Ahab. Meet me on Mount Carmel. So they get on Mount Carmel and Elijah says, listen, we're we're going to have a battle. We're going to have the showdown of the gods, all right? My God, the one true God, God of all heaven and earth and God of Israel, right? He says, we're going to have the showdown and I'll call on my God and your prophets of Baal, you call on Baal and Asheroth and whatever God answers by fire, the country will serve that God. And so that's what they did. They set up and the, the, 400, the hundreds of prophets of Baal and Asheroth began to cry out to their God. Of course, mute gods can't answer. Come on, somebody. Uh, the God of Facebook couldn't answer. It was bizarre. I knew they thought for sure, but it didn't happen. And uh, it's crazy, right? The God of Mammon didn't happen. So uh, anyhow, nothing happens. And Elijah calls on God, and sure enough, fire falls from heaven, right? And uh, they kill the prophets of Baal. They kill the prophets of Asheroth. Really, it was the greatest, arguably one of the greatest victories up to date in Israel's history. Man, Elijah was a great revivalist. In one moment, he turned a country that was running from God back to God. And King Ahab gets home, and he tells his wife Jezebel. Jezebel was, I think, possessed. She's serving the devil. And uh, she sends a text message to Elijah saying, it's over, man. What you did wasn't good. I'm mad at you for what you did. And I was thinking how it doesn't matter how good God has been. We are one text message. We are one sticky note. We are one phone call. We are one email away from discouragement. You know why that is? Because, check it out. That's what the Lord said. He said, son, people's opinions carry too much weight in your life. Oh, God. Woo, come on, somebody. We could just give an altar call there. Amen? Because we do. Like, like we do everything we do. Every picture we take, everything we do is for the like or the heart or the share on our social media. It's for someone to, to be encouraged about what, we, what we're doing, right? Really, it's not we're, we're living our life really not even for happiness, but for the appearance New Testament says something about this, that they'll have a form of godliness, an appearance of godliness, but deny the power of God that wants to reside in them. Right? Jezebel says, no, 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 I don't like what you did. I'm going to kill you. He just killed hundreds of prophets of Baal and Asheroth. And one woman sends him a message, and it has him running for his life. See, there's something, we're gonna, I'm going to use some sports analogies just because of the series. Is that okay? There's something about trash talk that is so real. Anybody trash talk when you played athletics? I did. I, I did. I can't help it. I still do. I play ball with my kids, and Jace, Jace is worse than me. He'll, he'll start, he'll, I'll let him shoot one. He'll make it, and he'll start talking trash. He'll be like, you can't guard me. And he'll shoot it. I kid you not. I volleyball spike it. I'm like, bow! And I blow it out. And I chest bump him. And I'm mouthing it. I'd probably go overboard. But nevertheless, I ain't playing around with him. Amen. I don't let him do that. He was, we were in Texas with our pastor friends down there, Family Faith Church. And uh, Pastor Drew. So Rachel preached here on Family Faith Takeover. Drew preached in Ash Grove. And, and Drew uh, was, Jace, my son was talking trash to Drew. He said, Drew, I'm going to beat you in Madden today. And Drew said, you going to beat me? You show not going to. That's how Drew talked. He said, no, I'm going to beat you. And so they started talking trash back and forth, and Jace got the Chiefs, and Drew got the Cowboys, and you can guess what happened. <laughs> Drew walked downstairs shaking his head, oh man, that wouldn't, go. amen. In Genesis 3, we see the enemy, by the way, his plan, his schemes never change. Because we see this in Genesis 3. Uh, Adam and Eve are walking in the garden and, and this, the serpent says to Eve, she says, hey, why don't you have one of these uh, pomegranates or apples or whatever the fruit was. And, and uh, uh, Perry Stone thinks it was a pomegranate, that's why I said it. Well, how, whatever the fruit you think, you know, the, whatever the fruit is, why don't you have one of these, this bite of this fruit. And, and she said, well, God said we couldn't. And, and the enemy said something that's been his ploy from the beginning of time till now. He said, did God really say? Did God really say you couldn't? Is that really, really what he said? See, guys, we have to understand. The ploy of the enemy hadn't changed, and he's a trash talker. That's all he does. 
And the purpose of his trash talk is to bring doubt in your mind. Because doubt gives birth to discouragement. Did God really say? And what happens is you get just a little bit of doubt in your mind. And then you get a little bit of discouragement that starts building up that because you're dwelling on that doubt. And pretty soon you're going, oh man, God, did God really say that? Well, maybe that was me that thought that. Maybe that was my dream. Maybe that was my idea. Maybe that was my flesh. And oh man, you know what? Maybe I'm not called. And you know what? Maybe I shouldn't take this job. And you know what? Maybe I don't deserve the promotion. And, and then it goes from there to saying, man, maybe I'm not worthy. Maybe I'm not loved. Maybe God doesn't really care about everything in my life. And that goes to this place that you're like, man, no one notices the things I do. My, my spouse doesn't seem to care. The pastor, the chair, whoever, my boss, no one seems to notice. No one even cares about me. No one likes me. And that birthed this thought of what if. So you have to understand his, his plan, his scheme, his ploy has never changed. It's always to cause just a little bit of doubt in your heart and mind. And that brings discouragement. And we have to understand that, understand that discouragement is always birthed out of a lie of the enemy. That's the truth. We have to understand that discouragement is always birthed out of a lie of the enemy. And so what happens is like Elijah, we begin to, to, we begin to question these things with a little bit of trash talk and become discouraged. And pretty soon, like Elijah, from one, one seed of doubt and fear, we're running from the things of God. In fear. But 1 Timothy 1 7 that we've not been, says we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of sound mind. He's saying, Paul's right, he says, listen, fear does not get to control you anymore. So that, that begs the question, what is fear and what is faith? See, I think I think that we feel that fear is operating or moving. Void, I'm sorry, that we think faith is moving void of fear. That's not what faith is. Faith is advancing in the presence of fear. Amen. That's when fear's talking and you're like, God call me, I'm doing it anyhow, right? Faith is doing it afraid, quite frankly. Faith is grabbing a sling and a stone while Goliath is talking in the background. Faith is saying, listen, I'll go into the fiery furnace. My God is able, but if not, I'm still going to do what God said. Faith is saying, I know you may throw me in a lion's den, but I'm going to pray anyhow. Faith is operating and doing and obeying the word of God despite what may happen, despite how you feel. That's what faith is. See, as believers, we get to order off of a hidden menu called faith. Right? We get to order off of a hidden menu that no one sees. I was eating at this Mexican restaurant, and they have uh, out of town, and they have this thing called the Burrito Chicago. And I heard about it, and I said, Ricky, I can't find Burrito Chicago on here. And he said, well, it's, it's, it's not on the menu. See, because of my connection with the oh my God, I'm going to preach. Because of my connection with the owner, I could order something that would bless me that not everyone had access to. That's what faith is. Faith is ordering something off of a menu that no one else has access to because they don't know it's there. But you do because of your relationship with the owner or the father. It's crazy, y'all. It's crazy. That's what, that's, that's what faith is. So we understand Elijah is in this place of, of discouragement. So my, my week one, what we're going to talk about is how to overcome discouragement in your life. So the first thing we have to understand, James, John 8, says the devil is a liar. And he's the father of lies. And everything he says is birthed out of the last line out of his own character because he's the liar and the father of lies. So we have to understand that discouragement... Uh, comes in the form of thoughts. And where do these thoughts come from? They come from the devil. Because if they don't align with the word of God. We, okay, so the basis of understanding that is, is understanding that, the, that God will never speak something to you that violates his word. He will never, his written word and his spoken word will never clash. That's why God will never speak to you. You don't have to tithe. Because he's not going to violate his own word. God will never speak to you. You should go cheat on your spouse. He'll never violate his word for your situation. Right? Listen, can I help you? You ain't that special. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. 
You ain't that special to cause him to be a liar. Amen? So we understand that everything he says is true, right? And then we have to understand that everything the enemy says is a lie. So if I understand that the devil is a liar and he's the father of lies, what does that mean? That means the opposite of what he's saying is probably true. But see, sometimes in our lives, and maybe this wasn't you, maybe this was just me. In 2020, it seemed like God was more silent than he was speaking. Anybody? Did anybody feel like, God, are you there? Are you, are you, hello? Are you, are you around? Anybody else? Sometimes, and matter of fact, I'm going to say it like this. Most of the time, God is more silent than he is speaking. Why? Because all he has to do is say one word and it doesn't change. Come on, somebody. But the enemy has to keep talking and talking and talking and talking. Let me give you an example. God said, let there be light. He don't have to say it every day. Light continues to exist because of something he said centuries ago. I need us to understand. So when God said that he had plans for your life, when God God said that you would be have hope and a future, that joy comes in the morning. When God said you would have life and life abundantly, he doesn't have to keep reiterate, reiterating something because he already said it. When he said it, he meant it. And when he meant it, he intended to fulfill it. So we're saying, God, don't you care that I'm discouraged? And he said, I already told you I didn't. I'll let you know if I change my mind. But the problem is, we struggle in silence. We've got to learn to be just as good stewards in God's silence as we are as guidance. But we struggle with silence. We struggle when we can't hear him. And maybe not you, but for me, it seems like I often can hear the enemy talking a lot easier than I can hear the Lord. Anybody else struggle with that? I hear these thoughts, man, you're terrible. You are, a, you are one poor excuse for a husband and a pastor. You ever, hopefully you don't hear that exact thing. <laughs> you, you have those thoughts? Why are you even trying? You're a terrible mom. You're a terrible dad. You're a terrible employee. You're a terrible brother. You hear those thoughts? See, it's funny because those thoughts are so much easier to hear. But when I understand that the devil is a liar and the father of lies... What can I, and every time he's speaking, he's lying, what can I know? The opposite is true. So when the devil says, you're horrible, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. He's lying. That means I'm good. Come on, somebody. When the devil, when I have a thought that says, you're not worthy. Oh, my God, I am made worthy. Come on, somebody, by the blood of the Lamb. See, when I have a thought that says, I can't, I get excited because if the devil's saying I can't, he must know there's something in me. Come on, somebody, that can't. When the enemy says, you, you won't, my, I get excited because I know if he's saying I won't, the opposite is true, and it must mean I'm about going to. Come on now. When the enemy says, you aren't, all of a sudden I get pumped up because if he's saying I aren't, I know that I am. See, sometimes it's really hard to hear God, and sometimes it's really easy to hear the enemy. So sometimes I don't, I, sometimes, this is horrible probably. I'm not saying this is the best practice, but sometimes I don't shut him up. Because I'm like, if he's speaking, he's lying. And he's probably prophesying about my destiny. See, we have to understand the basis of discouragement is birthed out of lies. And the devil is a liar. He's the father of lies, and he only speaks out of his own nature and character. So if he's lying about my future, then the opposite must be true. Come on, somebody. We see this in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30. David is... Uh, He's done a lot of really good stuff. And uh, at this point, he's a mercenary. And him and his, these guys that were completely broken, they were discouraged, in debt. They were a bunch of nobodies. He took them and trained them and made them these great, mighty men, the Bible calls them. And uh, he made them wealthy. And they got married and had kids. And they're all at war. And they come back. And Ziklag, where they were living, was completely burned with fire. Their women were stolen. Their children were stolen. And their stuff was stolen. And probably in 2020, some of us lost... And it said wives, it's referencing relationships. It said children, it's referencing legacy and future. It's referencing all their stuff, is referencing stability. In 2020, some of us probably feel like we've lost some of those things. That we've had some relationships stolen, some legacy stolen, some future stolen, some stability stolen. And then these guys that he poured his life into start talking about killing him. So now, the people that he's literally given his life to are turning their backs on him. And you know what he did? He said, okay, 
All right, call the prayer line. I need encouragement. He, he said, no, you know what? Nope. He, he, he got it and said, listen, guys, we are going to be a people of encouragement. We're not going to talk bad about one another. He said, Get Abathar, the priest. He said, Abathar, bring me the linen ephod. He didn't ask someone to pray for him or pray with him. He said, I need to hear from heaven right now. And he grabbed the linen ephod and he got along with God. And I like the way it says it. Um, in the next verse, I think it's verse 8, David inquired of the Lord, um, verse 9. That's okay. It says in, I think it's NIV, it said, it says inquired of the Lord. But in the NIV it says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Verse 6, put up verse 6. Did I miss it? David was greatly successful. The people had spoken of stoning him because of all the people were bitter in their soul, each of his sons and daughters. So David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. I love it. Because sometimes in your life when you are discouraged, it doesn't matter what people say. It isn't enough. It doesn't matter what, what your family, sometimes what you need is not to, for someone else to encourage you. Sometimes what you need is to learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. And that is declaring what his word says over your life. David said, okay, when I was a boy, you called me out of the field. You anointed me and said, you're going to be king of the nation. And I'm not king yet. And you don't lie. You're not the father of lies. If you said it, you meant it and you mean to fulfill it. So you said it and I'm not living it yet. So it may look like the end, but baby, it's just the beginning because you're not a man that you can lie. So God, it may look bad. This is what David was saying. But I know you mean to fulfill everything you spoke over my life. And David began to encourage himself in the Lord. The struggle we face as human beings is we don't know how to encourage ourselves in the Lord anymore because we don't know what he said. Can I help you? Can, I, can we get awkward? Can we get awkward? No one said yes. But no one said no, so that's permission. We're going to learn for the next few seconds how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. That means I'm not going to preach and I'm not even going to talk loud. I'm going to turn my mic off for about 10 seconds. But don't worry, it's not over yet. Come on, somebody. But we're going to take 10 seconds and you're going to prophesy. Prophesy just means to speak what God would speak. You're going to prophesy over your husband, over your spouse, over your children, over your finances, over your future, over your jobs, over your ministry. I don't care if you prophesy over the, what you're going to have for lunch. Come on, somebody. But right now, we are going to learn to encourage ourselves in the things of God. We are going to declare what he, we are going to agree with what he would say about us. So right now, just take a few seconds, lift up. Come on, somebody. I can't help but get myself happy. And someone says, that was a little awkward for me. You need to get used to it. You need to get used to it. Because rarely do people call me to encourage me. <laughs> Woo, go ahead. I learned to encourage myself in the Lord. Anybody else? So can I help you? Practice that. Practice that. That's what brought David through. And by the way, he took back everything the enemy had stolen. Plus interest. Verse, the second thing we do is we change our thought pattern. So we understand, first, we establish the understanding that the devil is the liar. He is the father of lies. And the second thing we have to do is change our thought pattern. Philippians chapter uh, 4, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Philippians 4, 6 through 9. I'm reading it in the message version because I think it's cool. It says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. You read that? Did you read that like I read that? Here's what we say. Listen, I'm going to fret and worry. Instead of praying, I'm going to worry. <laughs> Instead of petitions, I'm going to let Facebook know that I'm hurting. And hopefully people will call and send me text. 
No, that's not what the word says. The word says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape, you hear this? Shape your worries into prayers. It's like Play-Doh. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, it's like Play-Doh. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle, settle you down. My God, that's good news right there. Some of you all worked up. Some of you all depressed and stressing out. And he says, let me, let my presence settle you down. Here, let's keep going. We'll come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces your worry at the center of your life. He says it's great when worry and discouragement are filling you up. And Jesus shows up and kicks them out. And he says something new is on the throne of, of, of your life. Something new is on the throne of Mikey's life right now. Something new is on the throne of Brenda's life right now. And it's no longer discouragement. It's no longer worry. It's no longer depression. It's salvation. It's one of it happens. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you do your best filling your mind. Meditating on CNN. <laughs> Fox News. With Fauci's latest confusing report. Somebody else get confused by those? I never know. I don't know what to do with my hands anymore. No. Meditate on what's true and noble and reputable, authentic, compelling, and gracious. Check it. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise and not things to curse. He says you need to change your thought pattern. That's the problem. We understand that discouragement is based out of lies. And, and the devil is a liar. I can then change my thought pattern versus dwelling on the lies and start dwelling on his truth. But the problem is, we've bought into this theology, and I know it's all over the world. It's not just, we always blame stuff on America because we're kind of separated from the rest of the world. But I've been, and... They act the same way we act, and we're not special, uh, or not specially bad. Although my buddy from India says, we like to watch America because they find new ways to sin. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> Anyhow, they're just as bad as we are. But uh, now here's the reality. We've bought the lie of something called relative truth. Okay, your truth does not matter, <laughs> and neither does mine. There's only the truth, and the truth is founded in God's Word. For instance, let's say I'm having a conversation with Adam over here. And Adam says, hey, Bo, here's the thing. I don't believe in gravity. Listen, if you, if you don't believe in gravity, that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion, but watch. Not your own truth. Because when I can't put that back up, we're going to need that in a little bit. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Bring that back here. You're entitled to your opinion, but not your own truth. So if Adam says, I don't believe in gravity, and I'm like, look, gravity's true. See, truth isn't established on how you feel or what you think. Truth was established long before you were on the planet, and it will continue to be established long after you were on the planet. So in our culture, we've, brought, we've bought into the lie of relative truth. Well, I feel that God is okay if we're pro-choice. No, he's not. That is, a, that, is, that is a lie. That's not truth. I feel, people say, that God's okay with sexual perversion. No, he's not. It's, that's a relative truth that is not real. Now, you're entitled to your opinion. And matter of fact, Adam, after service, you're welcome to start. There's no gravity Facebook page. I will join it, follow, just to get laughs at home by myself. You're entitled to your opinion, but not your own truth. So God's not okay with abortion, but he loves people that have had them. God is not okay with sexual perversion, but he loves those that are caught in it. That's truth. That's truth. You're entitled to your opinion, but not your own truth. And that's what we have to understand. That God loves you where you're at, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. 
So when we understand that I'm discouraged and it's based, based in a lie and, and I can't help but hear the lie, so I know the opposite of the lie must be true, it brings me to this place that I begin to dwell on these things. Whatsoever is true, whatsoever is noble and pure. He says, I need you to shift your thought pattern and begin to think on the right stuff. I begin to think on the right stuff. Like, for instance, I was deer hunting. Jason, I, no, I was by myself. I was hunting by myself. There's another guy down the road. But anyhow, uh, I'm sitting there, and I watch seven bucks come out in front of me. And two of them were pretty good. And I'm looking at them through my binoculars. And listen, I don't care how I feel right now. When I think about just God's creation, and it was cold, and you could see your breath, but I'm all snuggly in my camo. Come on, somebody. And I watched those deer come out, and I just watched the one doe fight another doe and beat her up. It was awesome. <laughs> I, can't, I can't help. But when I think on stuff like that, and I think that I'm convinced that God made white-tailed deer because he knows I like to watch them and shoot them. Look, I, that's selfish, I know, but I feel that's true. When I understand that I think on those things, it changes my current attitude. But when you're dwelling on what hurts you and what made you mad, it only escalates. And you get madder and you think about more how you were wronged and how right you were and how wrong they are. Can I help you? You were wrong. Get over it. <laughs> Even if you weren't, you were wrong. Get over it. Doesn't matter what happened. The only way that we're going to change that is to change our thought pattern. And we think on these things. And the reality is we have to do it intentionally because it doesn't come easy. Here's a, here's a personal goal of my life. You can come to me. Adam, I'm going to keep using you. He could come to me and say, that Pastor Tim is a no good, worthless piece of junk. <laughs> Just kidding. But he could. Now, here's the reality. He could tell me everything that Tim did wrong to him. Pastor Tim did wrong to him. And first of all, I don't entertain gossip. But second of all, I have a personal thing in my life. I never let what someone says about someone else influence the way I feel about that person. But I also don't let it influence the way I think about that restaurant or that kind of truck or Jeep. <laughs> I don't. Why? Because everyone's entitled to their own opinion. I, I don't let what other people say about politics influence my, the way God showed me to vote. Are you with me? See, the problem in our culture is we've bought this, we've bought into this scheme of the devil that if you're mad at them I should be mad at them too no you shouldn't are we, are we, are we getting it today and we only do that if we understand that discouragement is birthed out of lies and the devil is a liar and I need to change my thoughts from what he's lying about to the truth of what God says and that brings us to the next point in the process and the next point in the process is turn your pouting into praising Amen. now anybody like to pout we all like to pout. Yeah, I like to pout every now and then. I do. Feels good, right? You guys never? No? Okay. Benny likes to pout every morning. Amen? We, don't, we just let him do his thing, get his cereal, and then he's happy. Amen? No, there's, there's something about us that likes to pout for a moment. Because it's okay to pout for a moment. But don't let a moment become a month. But that's what happens in our life. We start pouting. And pouting. But we don't change anything and pout. And we start dwelling on the wrong things and we pout some more. And we heard the lie of the enemy, but it felt right with our emotions. So I'm going to assume that identity, even though Christ saved you from that identity. We're going to assume that identity and we pout some more. And pretty soon, uh, pretty soon a moment of pouting turned into a month of pouting. And that's turned into 2020, a year of pouting. To a place, and we see this in Elijah. We see what Elijah did next, and we'll talk about this next week. But Elijah then isolated himself from humanity and the body of Christ. That's what pouting will do. That's what pouting will do. But Psalm 22 says it like this. I inhabit the praises of Israel. That word praises are seven, seven, not seven, seven words for praise in the, New, in the Old Testament. And, and specifically this one is the word tehillah. And it literally is giving God glory for your story. It's your testimony of praise. 
Notice he says, he, now he does show up when we corporately praise, but that's not what he says. We can't use that scripture to, to validate that experience. That scripture is specifically talking about Tehillah praise. He shows up when you are thanking God for what he's done in your life. How do I overcome discouragement? I understand the devil's a liar. I think on these things. And when I start thinking on these things, I start praising him for that. Uh-oh. When I start thinking on the deer and how cool it was to see him, I, honest to God, I just start thanking him. God, I thank you for deer. And Lord, I thank you for the deer that I've been able to harvest and the, the, the meat they've provided and the, the art they are on my wall. Come on, somebody. And I start, I start thinking on these things, and then I start praising him for that. And I continue praising him. I start thanking him for my family and a wife that allows me to deer hunt and my kids that like to do it with me. And I start praising him for where I live in the country. Come on, somebody. And all of a sudden, I'm praising him for my dad and my mama and my, my aunt and my uncle and people in the church and my finances. And I start finding reasons to praise him. See, it all started with understanding the devil is a liar. I think on these things. I praise him for that. And the next thing that happens in this process is we go from Tehillah praise to another type of praise called Hallel praise. It's hilarious praise. I call it prophetic praise. So we start thanking him. Or we, start, we understand he's a liar. We think on these things. We praise him for that. And pretty soon we're praying prophesying over a battle that we've yet to face and fight. So I'm struggling. I understand the devil's a liar. He says, I ain't going to make it. Then I already have. Here's what God says. I start thinking on the word of God. I start praising him for how he's brought me through before. And pretty soon I'm speaking to the Red Sea. And I'm telling it has to part. I'm speaking, I'm speaking to the Sea of Galilee. And I'm saying, oh, there's a storm raging. You have to be still or I'm walking across on top of you. But God called me to go to the other side. And can't nothing hold me back or stop me from doing what God's called me to do. That, guys, is prophesying. It's understanding that the devil's a liar. I'm going to think on these things. I'm going to praise him for that. And I'm going to prophesy to the storm or to the battle. A few years ago, I was, uh, several years ago, I was going to speak, gosh, probably 10 or 10 years ago, I was going to speak at a jail and uh, um, I was showing up and I was discouraged. You guys probably don't think I get discouraged because I'm a happy person. I get discouraged a lot. I just don't allow it to shape me. I don't allow it to shape my attitude. But that's where we struggle. Because we have an emotion. We think that emotion is an identity. So I walked through this process. I encouraged myself in the Lord. And I said, you know what, devil? You trying to discourage me? That must mean there's something incredible around the corner. But I'm going to win. Come on, somebody. That must mean there's something amazing. And here's the reality. I refuse to lose a battle that I ain't yet to fight because I refuse to deal with my emotions that I'm feeling today. So I said, I'm going to go to that jail. I, I don't want to. What I want to do is quit and go do something else, amen, or anything else. But no, discouragement does not dictate my future. See, Elijah, and we see this, and we'll see this in the weeks to come, but he allowed discouragement to dictate his current stance. But it was cool because at the end, what the enemy used to discourage Elijah raptured Elijah. Elijah got raptured out of this earth. It's really foreshadowing of the rapture of the church soon and very soon. And what the enemy used to discourage David, deployed David to become the king of all Israel. See, regarding discouragement, it can destroy you or deploy you. But the choice is yours and how you handle it. I was discouraged and I wanted to quit. I sure didn't want to go to a jail and preach to a bunch of inmates or a few. There wasn't a ton of people, a handful of inmates. I really wanted to go home and, and watch TV or something. You know what I mean? Like I want to do anything else. But I encouraged myself in the Lord, and I said, someone needs to hear something. The enemy's trying to stop. So I walk in that jail cell, and uh, I preach Jesus. I had like 15 minutes. I give a simple thought on, on the goodness of God. And like of six people, like four of them accepted Jesus as their Savior. Yeah. And then they asked me to spend the night. <laughs> hey, you want to stay the night and keep talking? I went, no. <laughs> I want to cuddle with a pretty blonde. I don't want to get cuddled. <laughs> the gospel. Nope, I'm going home. But thank you. <laughs> Let me call my mom. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> it's been hilarious. 
A part of me wanted to for the experience, but I said no. Anyhow, <laughs> the discouragement was real. But faith isn't moving in life and advancing without discouragement. It's in the face of discouragement. How you handle discouragement really will show you how you'll handle life. I, I don't know. Let's say that I said, nah, I ain't going. Surely, four people's eternity was impacted. But you say, well, yeah, but it doesn't affect what you're doing today. It doesn't affect the, the heal. It doesn't affect the, what we're doing and planting. And, and, you know, it was a moment, but it's okay. I disagree. I think if I don't learn years ago that discouragement is real and it's loud, but it doesn't get to control my future, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't still be here today for sure. I think that if, if I don't understand that in a moment of discouragement, I don't make rash decisions, I promise you I would not be still pastoring at the hill. But see, I learned how to handle something because there was going to be a battle around the corner that God had already given me victory for. I just had to get there. And that's the power of us overcoming discouragement in our life. The enemy's plan y'all, is to talk trash, is to cause doubt and discouragement in your life, to cause you miss, listen to this, to cause you to miss a victory or a battle that you've not even faced yet. And if we're not careful, we'll die in the discouragement versus living in the fullness of victory in Jesus Christ. I was thinking practically how 2020 has been so difficult for so many how it's been tough for different reasons. Some of us, COVID hadn't affected us at all. I mean, like, my family, we were pretty much ready for homeschool. <laughs> Didn't affect us at all. But other ways it did. See, this year, I think, was a, a, a divine plan of the enemy to cause discouragement and divisions within the body of Christ. And we have to understand his schemes because he wants the same thing he wants in the body of Christ he wants in your marriage. He wants division and doubt in your marriage and in your spouse and in your parenting. But what I understand that sorrow or discouragement only lasts for the night, but joy comes when I wake up, everything changes. Everything changes. So today, I want to say decide to beat discouragement. It's real. It's loud. It's so loud. But decide that it doesn't get to control your life and your thoughts and your future. It doesn't get to control the way you treat people. It doesn't get to control your attitude anymore. It's real. It's a real emotion. But it doesn't control you. You're controlled by another. The spirit of the living God. Power, love, and a sound mind. Would you bow your heads over the place? If you're here right now and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, or, or, or simply you're not living for him, mm. you're not serving him, and you're ready. You're ready to surrender your heart and say, Jesus, you can have every part of me. When I count to three, I just want you to take your hand up in the air. Here we go. One, two, three. Anybody here? Or maybe, maybe you're online. Maybe that's you and you're watching. It's just simply this, this simple prayer. Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come into my life and make me brand new. In Jesus' name. And the second thing I want to pray before we close service is maybe this year discouragement has been screaming. It's been telling you to quit. It's been telling you to, to quit in your marriage or to quit in your career or to quit in ministry or just simply to quit in some area. And, and, and you honestly, you just thought it, you, you probably, possibly even confused it as the voice of God. 
And maybe you didn't, maybe you just have been in that, that, that funk, so to speak, where you're like, God, I just, oh, I just feel like quitting. I'm no good and I'm worthless. But today you're going, okay, Lord, I understand. I understand that discouragement does not dictate my future any longer. And you're ready to come out of that cave of discouragement. And you're ready to step into everything that God has. You're ready to say, I, ref- I, I feel it. And it is an opinion, but it is not the truth. And I respond to the truth. And you're ready to surrender your life again and say, God, I'm done with discouragement. If that's you, so I count to three, just stand up. We're on praise for a second. I know this was me, so I'm already up. So if that's you, here we go. One, two, three. Are you here? Come on, yeah, praise God, praise God, praise God. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going forward in 21. Let me let me encourage us in the Lord. In 2021, we are advancing. We're moving forward. We're not allowing what we feel, what we see, the emotions. We're not allowing any of that to dictate our future any longer. God, you've called us. You've set us apart. God, you've redeemed us, paid with the price, covered. It may not be pretty, but it's pleasing. And God, we declare over our life and in 2021 that we are going forward we're moving we're advancing into each and everything that God has called us to do advancing as husbands and wives and children God advancing in our careers advancing in our callings we're no longer going to live in neutral we're putting our foot on the gas and we are going to do everything that God has called us to do